Now, this might be a slightly unusual introduction for our first keynote speaker because when I agreed to introduce him, we were friends. <laughs> but now, because of recent events, I'm mad at him. In fact, the entire CIA team is angry with our first speaker, but more about that later. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, this, this gentleman. Uh, a child prodigy, he was born and raised in Santa Monica, California, and he always loved food. He always loved cooking. He loved, in particular, the creative aspects of, of cooking. And in fact, when he was nine years old, he asked his mother if he could cook Thanksgiving dinner for the entire family. Now, now that's a pretty you know, high-risk proposition. She agreed, and he did extensive research, and at nine years old, pulled off the execution of an entire Thanksgiving meal. Uh, in what he says, uh, in a parallel universe, he might have become a chef, but instead, he went to UCLA. Uh, he attended there beginning at the age of 14. And uh, I always think of him, and I, I mean this in the best possible way, as kind of a real-life Doogie Howser, you know, attending UCLA at the young age of 14. And he earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a master's degree in geophysics and space physics. From UCLA, he went on to attend Princeton, where he earned a master's degree in mathematical economics and a doctoral degree in theoretical and mathematical physics. Then, from Princeton, he went to Cambridge University, where he did, I'm not making this up. <laughs> I know, it sounds like you know, a scriptwriter came up with this stuff, right? Uh, so he goes to Cambridge University, where he did a postdoctoral fellowship not just for anybody, but for the legendary Stephen Hawkins. This is unbelievable. He comes back to the United States, and he starts a software company, which becomes very, very successful. And it's while he has this software company where he is and his, his company are, are spied by none other than Bill Gates. Subsequently, Bill Gates and Microsoft acquire his company, I think, really to acquire the talents and intellect of today's uh, speaker. He was at Microsoft then for 14 years, where he ultimately rose to the number three rank in all of Microsoft. So uh, at that time, Bill Gates, Paul Allen had left the company, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, and number three, our, uh, our first speaker. Uh, at the zenith, the absolute height of its corporate power, Microsoft's corporate power and prestige, today's keynote speaker uh, was in charge of all of their research and development, innovation, and new product development. And that's about the time that he and I met, which, which we think was around 1994, 1995. Um, we had been introduced uh, to each other by mutual friends, Tim and Nina Zagat of the uh, Zagat Guide. And uh, Tim told me several times about, about our, our guest and said, you know, he's really, really serious about cooking. In fact, he uh, works in a restaurant uh, several days a week when he's finished with his responsibilities at, uh, at Microsoft. Uh, now, in, in my life, and probably the same goes true with a lot of you, there, there's a lot of people who say, oh, you know, so-and-so is like a gourmet chef. And I, I kind of always discount that because typically, it doesn't end up to, to be true. But anyhow, that's what Tim Zagat uh, told me. I wanted uh, to do a deal with Microsoft uh, utilizing uh, the CIA's content and applying them to DVDs, which obviously Microsoft had a lot of expertise in. So I traveled to Redmond uh, to, to meet with him, and I arrived at Microsoft headquarters where I had an entire hour scheduled with Nathan and given his responsibilities, I knew that that was an extraordinary amount of time to have. So I was ushered to his office, and you know, we had pre pleasant uh, greetings. 
And uh, after the greetings, he opened up the meeting by uh, telling me this. He said, Tim, we have an hour together today, and I know that you want to talk about technology. But I am sick of talking about technology. It's all I do. So I want to propose a deal with you. In our hour, we'll spend five minutes talking about technology if we can spend 55 minutes talking about food. So I said, deal. And I launched in to my pitch about why Microsoft and uh, CIA should collaborate on DVDs. Uh, I got about 45 seconds into my little pitch where he stopped me. You know, he called a timeout and he said, Tim, forget about it. So I was already crestfallen. And he said, and here's the reason why. He said, think of DVDs as a star in a distant galaxy that has died. People on Earth just don't realize it yet. He said, everything in the future is going to be on the internet. Come back with an internet idea, and maybe we can talk. And of course, he was right uh, about that. Um, from that point, uh, we became friendly, and he was uh, building a new house uh, with what is probably still the greatest home kitchen ever constructed. So he asked if I might provide some uh, input into the equipment that he would put in, uh, in the kitchen, which was very fun. And as soon as I agreed, um, I started to get these very lengthy emails, 20 or 30 pages, uh, the most exhaustive analysis I had ever seen on broilers <laughs> or ovens. I mean, it was, it was kind of overwhelming, but he was, I mean, this was intense, insightful, you know, just genius stuff. And that coupled with my long discussion with him about the culinary arts and about chefs that we had had in Redmond, I said, this is really, really an unusual man who has deep insights and knowledge and passion into our industry. And of course, this all foretold uh, things to come. Uh, most recently, he became quite well known throughout the world and particularly in culinary circles for his uh, seminal work, Modernist Cuisine, which was published in uh, 2011, and simply put, Modernist Cuisine is one of the most important uh, cookbooks of all time. I would rank it in the top four uh, ever. Even to, to call Modernist Cuisine a cookbook is to seriously understate uh, what that work represents and, uh, and entails. Uh, as Nathan was finishing up Modernist Cuisine, I had the good fortune to travel out to his uh, lab and take some friends on many occasions so we could see what he was doing and, and enjoy some uh, fabulous meals uh, out there. And when he was through with uh, his promotional tour for Modernist Cuisine, uh, he and a, a group of colleagues traveled to uh, Spain where we enjoyed an unbelievable meal, one of the last meals at, uh, at El Bulli. And so that was a, a tremendous uh, adventure and a treat for us. Uh, he followed the publication of Modernist Cuisine with a book called Modernist Cuisine at Home, a single volume, but uh, a tremendous distillation of the work that was accomplished through the publishing of Modernist Cuisine. And then uh, most recently, uh, he has released the photography of Modernist Cuisine. And all of that brings us to why I am so mad at our guest uh, this morning, uh, or this afternoon, because his next major project is going to focus on baking and pastry, something that he's talked about for, for many years, and he and I have, have talked about it. The next project, which commences in January, uh, will be three books, one on baking, one on pastry, and one on breads. And for those projects, Nathan lured away, he stole one of the CIA's top pastry chefs, Francisco Magoya, and uh, to be a co-author. And so we recently you know, found out, uh, found out ab about that. And uh, therefore, the entire CIA community is kind of ticked about the whole thing. 
So actually, I'm, I'm not mad at Nathan at all. Uh, we've just been joking uh, about that. He remains a good friend and we're really, really proud of, uh, of Francisco. But last night we had a little uh, dinner together and it was the first time since Francisco made the decision to join Nathan's team for the new books. It was the first time that Nathan and I had, uh, had seen each other and uh, as I approached him, uh, I playfully put my hands around his throat. And uh, as I kind of lightly choked him, I, I jokingly said, I told you to stay away from Magoya. And we had, we had a good laugh uh, about that. <laughs> At least I did. Uh, I then said, Nathan, you do realize that I am going to introduce you tomorrow. And uh, what do you think it is that I'm going to say about you? I'll show you what he said in, in response. <laughs> Truthfully, it, that, didn't, that kind of language never even occurred to me. One of the, one of the core values of the CIA is, uh, is professionalism. But, so, uh, yeah, but I wanted to let you know what he said he thought uh, that I would say. So uh, without any further ado, we're, we're thrilled to have him here today. I know he's going to give a, a, an insightful and uh, tremendous talk. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our, our opening speaker, a great friend and a colleague, one of only two people in the CIA's almost 70-year history to be given honorary alumni status at the CIA. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to that dirty rat bastard, <laughs> Nathan Miraval. Well, there really isn't very much I can do to respond to that, except to say, you know, you know, Tim, you got a lot of faculty. <laughs> we got a lot of space in Seattle. Just saying. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, science of cooking and innovation and creativity and how I see those um, uh, working together. OK, so as, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, we write cookbooks. That's what uh, my team and I do. Uh, we've had three new big books. Uh, a lot of people complain that these books were really big and heavy. We kind of like them that way. Uh, we actually have one that's light now. Uh, yesterday, the ebook went went on sale. Um, I used to say that modernist cuisine was not that expensive because per pound it cost less than Parmesan cheese. Um, I can't say that with the ebook anymore because bits don't really weigh anything. Um, but uh, th that's the set of books that we've done. This is where we do it. This is our culinary laboratory. Um, and everything I'm going to talk about today is a team effort. Uh, without having a whole team of people, you couldn't possibly do a restaurant, but you also couldn't possibly uh, make a set of books like we do. So everything I say and do about this is really supported by a team of incredible people. Uh, this is our current culinary team. We've had a number of alumni of the culinary team, uh, at least one of which, I, Max, is uh, in the audience. Um, it's a fantastic uh, team of folks to work with. So, Innovation builds on knowledge of fundamentals. I was thinking about a couple ways to do this and explain this, and here's one of the ways. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza in, uh, in Egypt. And you can see it's a nice, clean pyramid shape. Now, if you go a few miles from Giza, there's a place called Saqqara. Saqqara is where there's a number of other pyramids. And you get this pyramid. And this pyramid is called the Bent Pyramid. You think, now, why would someone make a pyramid that looks like this? Well, it turns out that the uh, Great Pyramid has a 52 degree angle. The Bent Pyramid started off at 54 degrees. It's too steep to, to hold up with the tensile strength stone they had. Some poor guy had to come and say, um, Pharaoh, we have news. <laughs> you know that shoot the messenger thing? That, that started somewhere, <laughs> and maybe that's where it started. So they were building it at 54 degrees, thinking, yeah, why not? And it turned out they couldn't make it structurally uh, work. 
So halfway through, they had to change it to 43 degrees. Okay? It was, they didn't understand the fundamentals of engineering. They were doing by guess and by gosh, and this time it didn't work. When you understand fundamentals, it gives you great freedom. Um, this is a bridge in Minneapolis that collapsed a few years ago. You'd really like guys that build bridges to understand all the technical details of how bridges stay up. And if you understand that, you can make bridges like this. This is a Calatrava bridge. It's beautiful. It's creative. It's totally enabled by understanding a bunch of nerdy details. When it comes to making these bridges, there is no division between, oh, there's creativity over there and all this sciencey engineering stuff over here. No, it's the understanding of that engineering that enables, empowers someone to be as creative and build a bridge that's a sculpture, that's something beautiful to look at. Well, that's our philosophy about understanding the fundamentals of food uh, versus the creativity. You can, anyone with a certain set of skills can follow a recipe. But following a recipe is not by itself creative. It's repeating someone's crea creativity, that's nice. If you want to create your own things, you need to understand how stuff works. It's not enough just to say, I'll follow the recipe. So you know, throughout hi history, chefs have created all kinds of empirical rules and recipes. Uh, here's Julia Child. You can't read it very well, but that's uh, Escoffier's great cookbook. In Escoffier's time, you say, do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, and many of the do this is are very imprecise. They say, cook until done. Well, in an apprentice system, that's OK. Escoffier was writing for someone who had apprenticed who knew what done meant. And he was just providing the very, the very scantest amount of notes uh, to communicate what was needed on top of that. These days, I think we, need, we can do better. We can explain how things work. We can explain things precisely and then use that as a springboard of creativity. So I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of that. We're understanding a scientific thing that may sound very nerdy leads to something creative. OK, so these are pretzels. And how do pretzels get so nice and brown on the outside? You know, what's, what's the deal with that? Well, all bakers know you achieve it with this stuff. We zoom in. It's lye. Okay, this is also, you have some at home called Drano. Basically the same de deal. Um, it's this horrible, noxious chemical. But in an alkaline environment, the browning reactions that create browned food Mostly they're the Maillard reactions, named after a, uh, a French chemist. These Maillard reactions happen at lower temperature in an alkaline environment. Now, one aspect of that is if you want stuff to brown well, don't put it in an acidic marinade first. You are inhibiting browning with your acidic marinade. Conversely, if you want your pretzels to get super brown, what you do is you dip them in a lye solution. That makes a very alkaline environment and then at the same temperature that would make, a, uh, would make ordinary dough be golden brown, they will be the, that dark, dark brown. So I was thinking about this. I thought, well, you know, that's got to work for more than just pretzel dough. So we started trying it. Um, instead of using lye, uh, which you kind of don't want to eat, um, we use baking powder, which is uh, much milder, but it also creates an alkaline environment. So we tried carrots. And boy, oh boy, does it ever brown those carrots. In fact, it allows those carrots to brown in a pressure cooker. Which takes us to another whole thing. Why does a pressure cooker work, and how does that happen? Well, normally, b water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But that boiling point depends on the ambient pressure. If you're high in the mountains, if you're in Aspen or Telluride, it'll actually blow, uh, boil at a much lower temperature. And you need to take that into account when you are uh, cooking or baking in that because the temperature isn't the same. Now, conversely, if you put a lid on it and you pressurize it, uh, it goes up to where a temperature in a conventional pressure cooker when you're at sea level is about 250 degrees, so substantially elevated. Well, what we found is if you add baking soda, about a half percent by weight, 
Um, you, you never do cooking to taste with baking soda, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> You can get stuff that browns all the way through. Well, we tried it for carrots. Then we tried it for a whole bunch of other things. We have a whole chapter in Modernist Cuisine at Home that's on all kinds of different things, all inspired by pretzels. Now, none of these taste like pretzels, but if you take one, the, um, uh, you're not going to be able to read the text here, I'm sorry, but one of the orange ones in the upper row is uh, apple parsnip. Now, apples, aren't, uh, apples are white, parsnips are white, you put them together and they're white. You put in this alcohol, uh, the baking powder and you pressure cook them and it turns this wonderful orange and you get these rich flavors. It's not just a color thing. The flavors of, these, uh, of all of this stuff becomes enormously impacted. Uh, well, once we did this, we started doing tons of other things with it. Uh, we render fat this way. If you render fat in a pressure cooker with a little bit of uh, um, uh, baking soda, you can get the wonderful roasted fat flavors without damaging your fat. If you dry render fat, like cooking bacon, you can get some of those roasted flavors, but you damage the fat, it goes rancid more quickly, it's got a bunch of issues. Here's another one. Uh, so <clears throat> cream is a fabulous uh, thing. Uh, we're all mammals. Milk is, is how uh, we're nourished when we're very young, and cream has always been a leading component but what's, uh, of cooking. What is cream? Cream is a combination of oil and water. The oil in this case is butter fat, and the water is the water that uh, occurs naturally in milk. And it's an emulsion. An emulsion is where you take two things that won't mix, and you beat the hell out of it until it's in little droplets, and it'll be semi-stable. Uh, this is an emulsion. There's a, a photograph I took under the microscope where each of those little droplets are droplets of oil. And the emulsions become stabilized when there's something else in there that can coat those um, uh, oil droplets and keep them from sticking together and becoming one big droplet. In the case of cream, that stabilization is the casein proteins in milk. They all th they isolate this, and this allows milk to deliver protein and fat, which is really important for nourishing the baby. Okay, so I got to thinking, and of course we, we, we cook with emulsions all the time. You make mayonnaise, that's an emulsion. Why don't we just make cream out of any arbitrary fat and any arbitrary water-based liquid. So we started doing that. And it turns out it works really well. Uh, you can make it as thin as cream or as thick as mayonnaise by just varying the amount of the oil or the amount of the uh, uh, liquid. So we started innovating with this and coming up with lots of things. This is uh, one of our dishes. This is a, uh, we call it a jus gras, a, a fat uh, jus. Many uh, French, classic French dishes you uh, mount with or finish with butter or with cream. It enriches the uh, sauce, it thickens the sauce, but it also puts the, fl the wonderful flavors of cream and butter in there, which can detract from what you're trying to do. So when we started making a roast chicken dish, we would fatten or we would uh, enrich the sauce with rendered uh, chicken fat, schmaltz. Now, we actually render it with the baking soda trick I mentioned a little while ago, so it's this wonderful roasted thing you get a chicken sauce that is profoundly tasting of chicken in a way that no cream-based chicken sauce ever would or ever did. Um, well, we didn't stop there. We made a veal and cream sauce, which is kosher, because, in fact, the cream isn't cream. It's rendered veal fat uh, and veal stock that we then uh, uh, turn into an emulsion. It, besides being uh, kind of funny to talk about because it, uh, it's kosher, Veal is mild. It's very easy to overwhelm the flavor of veal with a cream sauce so that it becomes, it isn't very veal-y anymore. Veal's a great example of something where in working with a mild, subtle ingredient, we have to be careful not to overwhelm it. This, this achieves that and allows us to have a veal sauce that tastes of veal. But we kept going on from there. Um, I, I love pistachio ice cream and gelato. But pistachio is another mild flavor. And so usually when you have a pistachio ice cream, it isn't pistachio, it's really a green ice cream. Because by the time you have the cream, and especially if you uh, add uh, egg yolks and you have a creme anglaise based uh, ice cream, it doesn't taste like pistachio anymore. Well, there's various chef's tricks around this. The most common one is you add almond extract. Because it's cheap and it tastes like nuts, and if it's green and it kind of tastes like nuts, you can kind of fool people. 
Um, well, we decided we'd do something different, so we grind our pistachios, separate out the oil, then we take water and that pistachio oil, and we make a pistachio cream. Uh, and it makes an incredible gelato. Now, technically, it's actually a sorbet, right? It just has nuts, sugar, and water in it, and a little bit of stabilizer to take the, uh, the place of those casein molecules. So it's really a sorbet, but it tastes like the richest ice cream you've ever had, um, and it's completely vegan, which is another strange thing. Normally, if I said I've got a vegan gelato uh, for you, most people would assume, well, you might say a vegan sorbet, but you could never have a vegan gelato, right? And if you did, I think we'd all come at it expecting that it would be a compromise, that it would be something that would be, yeah, it's sort of kind of, you can see your way towards that, but it can't really be good because you need all that cream. Turns out you don't. Um, uh, at least to my taste, the ice creams and gelatos that we make this way are as good as anything you'd make anyway um, because they celebrate the ingredient. But it's all a way of taking a very simple idea of an emulsion of a cream and then just elaborating on it. Um, there's uh, another whole uh, thing we can talk about, how you cook food. Of course, cooking uh, is mostly about applying heat to food. And you apply f heat to food to make an irreversible change. This is one of the photos from Modernist Cuisine. It's actually the same steak. The reason it's higher in the center one is that it actually expands for a while, then it contracts. Well, in conventional cooking, we have a 400-degree uh, pan. We put a steak in. We're trying to cook that steak to an interior temperature, say 130 degrees. That's roughly medium rare. Outside of the steak is going to be roughly, the very brownest edges will be roughly 350 degrees, because that's what it, it takes to brown it. And you get this problem. And the problem is the medium rare part of your medium rare steak is only about 60, not even 60% of it. 43% is overcooked. And you might say you like it that way. And if you like it that way, I have no problem with that. But it begs this question, is there some way we can deal with the fact that conventional cooking overcooks the edges? Well, that meat, uh, Joseph Fourier, um, and this is maybe the first time a partial differential equation has been discussed at the Culinary Institute of America. <laughs> Fourier discovered the laws by which heat diffuses through a, a, um, a substance. This is the equation. The key thing is that constant K. That's the diffusivity. It governs the, the rate at which heat moves. It's called coefficient of thermal diffusivity. Turns out steak is this value. It turns out that's about like wood. In fact, it's sort of like a really light wood, like balsa wood. Food is an insulator. To put this in perspective, if you look at the diffusivity of copper in a copper pan or aluminum, it's roughly 100 times faster than this. So the reason that you can char the outside of a steak and have it raw in the middle is because it's basically an insulator. It's like you're heating a piece of wood. And when you heat it up super fast, you're going to overcook the outside just to get the inside Right. Well, is there a way around this? The answer is there is, and sous vide is one of the ways, but uh, actually a, uh, a CVAP oven or a combi oven uh, is a way to achieve this without uh, a slightly different way. And here what we do is we cook at a temperature just slightly above the temperature we want uh, the food at, so maybe one degree above. And so now when we have our food cooked at medium rare, it's medium rare all the way at the edge. But what that means is you still, if you want that charred surface, you now have to do something different for the surface. And the question here is, why compromise? Now, I've had people ask me, well, doesn't sous vide take the soul out of cooking? And I say, I, I don't know what's soulful about overcooking the top and bottom of my steak. I, I, I don't get that. Um, and by the way, it doesn't mean that all cooking becomes easy. You still have to have flavors and textures. There's still enormous room for creativity. But letting a machine make my, my meat be perfectly cooked edge to edge, I think is cool. Now, there's many people who say, but I prefer it the other way for some set of reasons. I'm again, I'm totally cool with that. But you need to understand it's an option. And so understanding how heat, heat moves th through food gives you that option. And you can then decide to go any way you want on that whole uh, spectrum. A lot of things in uh, cooking are a contradiction. This is a roast chicken. 
And the great contradiction in roast chicken is we want that outside to be uh, crispy, we want the inside not. Well, to have the flesh cooked properly, to my taste, it should be, you know, 55, 60 C, or a little, actually should be 50 to 65 C, uh, 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The outside is going to have to be about 300 and 350 to be crispy. But the thickness of that skin is about the thickness of a shirt. And how on earth do you get your shirt to be 350 degrees and not have your chest get overcooked? <laughs> it's, it's a problem. Um, now, there's two solutions to this. One solution says the hell with roasting whole chickens. Pull the skin off, cook the skin one way, cook the, the, the meat a different way, and put them back together. It works great. But we said, hey, look, maybe there's a way that we can do a roast chicken that's all together. And maybe there's some food traditions we could learn from. Um, so, you know, typically in cooking, you don't do that. You pick a compromise. You pick 350 degrees or 450 degrees. And most roast chicken recipes say, I'm going to compromise somewhere on this spectrum. I'm going to make that compromise. Um, well, when we did the roast chicken, we actually learned from this technique. This is Peking duck. And Peking duck is this very elaborate procedure. And it needs to be elaborate because you have an even harder problem in duck than you do with chicken because there, it's not just you want the skin to be crispy, the skin has got this thick layer of rubbery fat. And by the way, it's rubbery not because it's fat. It's rubbery because it's full of collagen. Okay, it's... Uh, Duck fat actually melts at very low temperature, okay, it, much low, lower than body heat. But it's full of uh, a very tough collagen, so what do you do? So we have this whole thing. First, we separate the skin from the breast. Then we inject it with brine. We never dip the bird in brine. Because brine affects the meat, and it makes it juicier. But juicier skin is rubbery skin. So we inject the brine, and we're careful not to spill any brine on the skin. Then we hang it in the refrigerator. This is a technique that's used with Peking duck. You hang it in the fridge um, for a couple days. That both lets the uh, brine distribute evenly in the meat. It also dries the skin out. And the drier I can get that skin, the crispier I'm going to have the bird at the end. Then we roast it for four hours at 145 degrees. Okay, this is not... Remember, we, it, we hung it for a couple days in the oven. This is not a quick recipe. But if you really want the ultimate, that's what you have to do. And by the way, the Chinese have done a pro process like this for, for duck for, for a long time. The other thing is we don't truss it. You don't truss it because we actually want the legs to be away from the body because the legs need a little more heat than the body does. And any way I can heat the, the legs up faster, I'm happy with. So we, we, uh, we like actually cooking it uh, hung upside down like this. Then finally, I cook the skin a second way. I, I get in the oven as hot as we can get it, 550, 600 degrees, and just cook it for a few minutes. It's a lot of trouble, but if you want to resolve that inherent contradiction without a compromise, this is the no compromise way. You always, of course, could compromise. And it makes this fantastically uh, good skin. It, you thump it with your, like this, and it cracks like glass. Uh, eggs are a fantastic thing to, to cook uh, sous vide because at every single temperature, there's a different texture. The whites uh, set at one set temperature and have one textural thing. The yolks at a different one. Uh, so we came up with this. This is our custard table. And the custard table allows you to predict what texture you get for a given amount of dilution. How much liquid did I put in versus how hot did I cook it? We did hundreds of experiments to do this. Um, but I'd like to point this out because I call this modernist by attitude. It's not a modern thing because we use fancy equipment or tons of science. We took the trouble to go do all these experiments. Escoffier could have done this, but in his era, it was cook till done, you're the apprentice, that's what you're supposed to, to do is gain all that practice. Um, these days, in the connected kitchen theme we have here, the world wants to understand these techniques without apprenticing for 20 years. It's best to, to actually do the work and make one of these. Uh, so we make, uh, made hundreds of, of little custards, kind of got fat. Um, <laughs> that allowed us then to do all kinds of other stuff. After this, we started doing baked omelets. Now, baking an omelet sounds like a contradiction in terms, but once you understand the right temperature and the right mix, you can actually bake an omelet and have a perfect texture. 
Um, here's an example then of once we were baking omelets, uh, when I went to chef school in France, I learned how to make a biscuit joconde, that's a cake that looks like this. You make it by having two uh, batters, one stiff dark batter that you put down, and you strike it across with this thing called a pastry comb. Well, if you can do that for a cake, why can't you do that for an omelet? So, uh, so we did. Um, a couple years ago, we actually served this to Pierre Hermé. Uh, he came to our lab, and he says, hey, I invented that. I said, well, that's great, but did you ever use it on an omelet? He said, no. <laughs> uh, it's a great example of taking uh, an idea from one place and applying another. In this case, an idea from pastry can be applied over to a savory dish, but only if you first figured out how you can make omelets in a sheet pan. Uh, centrifuge is one of our favorite toys. This spins things at high speed. Uh, this is uh, peas that we've uh, taken here. You grind up peas, you spin it in the centrifuge, it separates out into three layers. You get a pea broth, what we call pea butter and pea starch. The butter isn't oil, it's, but it's got all the flavor molecules in the pea. And it has this fantastic butter-like uh, texture. And a, a lot of people will give me grief that uh, science-based cooking is, takes away from the ingredients, and it's sort of the opposite of farm-to-table stuff. And I said, hey, you should try this pea butter, because this allows you to experience peas, fresh garden peas, in a way like that you've never experienced before. It celebrates an ingredient. Science isn't necessarily about obfuscating it or making it technical. It can also be creative, and it can be very ingredient-centric. This is the broth. You serve that separately. Um, so that is a, an example of some of the things that we've done. I, I want to share a story from last night that's another one of these examples of something being modernist by attitude. Um, uh, I was uh, dining with Tim, as he told you. Um, he had a little too much to drink, but I don't think that's news to anyone who knows him. Um, and uh, Gina Gallo was at the table. She would very uh, graciously donated all the wine for the thing. We were talking about the Cabernet. And she said that what she really valued in a Cabernet was the savory qualities of it. And I had maybe a little more wine than I should have also, because uh, I turned to Tim and I said, get me a salt uh, cellar. And much, I think, to the horror of everyone on the table, I proceeded to salt the wine. That's absurd, right? Who would ever do that? But turn it around. Who would send a plate out that you hadn't seasoned? We always try to, to season food or correct food. We, and salt is, there's many things you season with, but salt is probably the most common one. So if in fact you want a set of savory qualities, why not try a little bit of salt? Well, we started adding it, we had a little, a little too much, a little too little, we started tasting it. Gina started running around other tables saying, can you believe what these people are doing? But then she was making them taste it. Um, turned out it worked pretty well for the Chardonnay also. Salting, putting a little bit of salt in wine is not high tech. Um, but it's an example of something that you get when you decide you break rules. That you can creatively apply an idea you have one place and apply it someplace else. You know, we take the, the most common thing we do in food is we, we season stuff. Why can't you season your wine? By the way, what it does is it brings the wine more into balance. Obviously, you can put too much in. But when we salt food, we're not typically trying to make it super salty. You know, maybe a pretzel is, or a popcorn would be a counterexample. What you're trying to do typically in seasoning is balance flavors. Because what we perceive as flavor is a mixture of things. And of course, wine has many flavors going on at once. But by adding just a tiny bit of salt, you alter that balance, and, and sometimes for the best. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thanks very much. <laughs>